Hey family, so good to see you. This is day seven of our biblical meditation series, which means after today, I'm gonna cut this series off. I don't know, might go a couple minutes longer than I normally do. I'm gonna try not to, but I feel like I have a lot to say to close this all up. So the last couple of days, we learned about biblical meditation methods. And there were eight different methods that we learned. We learned about emphasizing different parts of the scripture, memorizing the text, putting a picture, illustration to it, applying it to your life, um, writing it out in your own words, rewriting it out, praying the text, lots of different methods that we talked about. And all of them are important. All of them have their place. And there are probably 15 to 20 other methods that are viable and valuable and could be used in your life. But again, I chose the ones that were personal and effective for me. The ones that I use, the ones that I put into practice and apply them to my life so that I can draw on the name of God, so I can draw on what he said to me, so I can reach forth and be able to grab in a time of need, comfort, assurance, safety, peace, 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 perfect peace, because my mind has been stayed on him, because my mind has been in his word. And not only have we been looking at methods for biblical meditation, but the last couple of days we have been looking at some different Bible characters. We started off with Joshua and God told him to meditate on the scripture day and night so that he could obey it. We looked at uh, David and all the Psalms that he wrote and how he was able to not only meditate, but he talked a lot about the importance of meditation. And then there is Mary who when she was going through something and nobody else understood it, it was her meditation life she was able to fall back on and pray those scriptures and sing psalms and spiritual songs and hymns of praise. And then we talked to her about her son, Jesus, who was also our savior and how even he relied on biblical meditation to overcome temptation, to overcome the devil when he came to him. His one weapon was, it is written. But we have to remember that their meditation ultimately led to application. Meditation without application is useless. All you do is get a head full of knowledge, but it becomes useless to you if you can't draw on it, if you can't apply it. Remember, we quoted a guy, Matthew Henry, and he said, application is the life of teaching. It's also important to remember that meditation is not about you personally but meditation is about being more like God. And therefore there are two parties in the biblical meditation process. There is the Christian and there is the Holy Spirit. So that means that if you're watching this, hopefully the two parties in your biblical meditation process are you and the Holy Spirit. Now, when it comes to the idea of biblical meditation, you need to have some goals because goals are important in life. Goal is not necessarily the same thing as dreams though. You can dream about owning a company. You can dream about becoming a lawyer or a doctor. You can dream about playing a professional sport. You can dream about having financial security and a successful marriage and a great family, but that's all it will ever be is a dream if you're not working at it. However, when you work at it, that's called a goal. And the goal only happens when you work towards it. A goal is when you show up early and you stay late and you don't quit until you accomplish whatever that goal happens to be. And so you need to have a goal in biblical meditation as well. You need to be able to wrestle with the scripture and you need to say, I'm not going to close this book until I get something out of this passage that applies to my life. Um, I'm going to give you an example. For me, I love 1 John chapter 5. I love verses 11 and 12. But if I really wanted to get something out of that verse, what I can do is I could take 1 John 5, 11 and say, hey, I'm not going to stop thinking about this scripture until I get 10 points out of it. And I don't think you can see all my fingers there, but 10 points, I held up 10. And can you imagine if you read a passage and you said, hey, I'm not going to stop thinking about this passage until I get 10 points out of it. Well, you could say four 
and if you set your goal at four, then four is all you will get. I don't think you should start out saying 20 or 25 points unless you're an astute Bible student already. But I think it's fair that if you have a favorite scripture or favorite passage that you can quote for memorization anyways, there should be about 10 things at least you can get out of it. So I'm going to share with you to give you an example of what I did with 1 John chapter 5. So 1 John chapter 5 verse 11 in the New Living Translation says, This is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life and his, this life is in his son. So you've read the verse with me, you know what the scripture says, and what I would do is I would pull out my notebook, I would pull out a pen, at the top of my paper I would write 1 John chapter 5 verse 11, and then I would begin to put numbers down the side of my page, and my goal this time is 10. I want 10 points out of this specific verse. And if you set yourself at 3 or 4 points, you'll probably get that every time. But challenge yourself to think about this scripture, to ponder on it, to muse on it, and to really pull out. Just like that tea bag again, let it seep in and say, what can I get? And I'm not going to leave this text. I'm not going to close this Bible. I'm not going to shut down this app until I get my 10 points. So I want you to see uh, my notebook here. So you can see at the top, I wrote the verse on there. And then I've got 10 points there that I wrote. And I know you can't read this online. I know that the screen is probably too small. I know that my handwriting is absolutely terrible. I write in tongues apparently. But what I want to do is I want to share with you the 10 points. I'm going to put the verse back up on the screen for a second. And the first point I got is that God has testified about eternal life. God testified about this. The second point is testimony can be upheld in the court of law. The third point I got is that God has testified about what he has done for us. Number four is, he testified, he gave us eternal life. That's the fourth thing I could pull from this. Number five is that this life is in Jesus. And if I want eternal life, then I need Jesus. Um, this life is eternal, meaning it's forever life. Number seven is forever does not end. So that means eternal life does not end. Uh, the eighth point I got out of this is if this life is eternal, once I have it, I can't lose it because it's forever. And then number nine is there's no possibility for me to lose it because it's in Jesus. It's not in me to begin with. So therefore, it's his responsibility to keep me. And then the 10th thing I got is God's testimony is greater than my own testimony. So you see how we took that one verse and I didn't Google that. I didn't search in it. I just spent a few minutes in the word and I said, what 10 points can I get out of this scripture? And that's one of the things that you want to do. You have to refuse to be defeated by the text. You have to be tenacious in this sense. You want victory in your life. You want some understanding about the times. You want to know how to have peace of mind. It can't come from just reading the text. Sometimes you need to slow down and maybe read a little bit less and meditate a little bit more. Now, not enough Christians out there read their word at all, so they do need to read a little bit more. But if you start a reading, don't just flip through the pages. Instead, slow down and say, God, what can I get out of this text? What authority are you trying to institute in my life? What part of your covenant are you trying to help me understand so that I can have surety, I can have a down payment of confidence that you're gonna do what you said you were gonna do. Now, one of the things I like to do is I like to use a website I'm gonna show you here. It's called BibleStudyTools.com. And this is important for you to know because if you always Google scriptures and scripture references, you ultimately are going to stumble into somebody else's opinion who's unlearned or worse, they're deceitful. And it's dangerous to learn the Bible from unlearned people. And it's even more dangerous to learn them from false prophets or people who want to deceive you. And so BibleStudyTools.com is a trusted website I like to use. When I can't find a point or I want to cross-reference or I want to know what else the Bible has to say or what our church fathers had to say, this is a great website for you to look up commentary. Um, it's a great website for you to find cross-references, for you to find word studies, for you to find different translations of the Bible. And these are trusted, tried and true authors that we can lean on. We can look back at church history and say, yes, they are an authority and they can help us understand the word of God. Remember, on this meditation journey, you're not in a rush. Just like that great meal, you sit down with your friends or your family or a date. 
you don't rush through that meal. You take your time and you enjoy it. Enjoy your journey in God's word. It is amazing. I promise you, Job said he desired God's word more than his necessary food. You know, Jesus said in chapter 13, verse 17 of John, that if you know these things, you are blessed when you do them. So what he's doing is he's insinuating that there's a danger in simply knowing the word, hearing the word, or reading the word, and not doing it. You don't want to read the word just to say that you've studied the Bible and not do it. There's a danger or a curse that can come on your life. There's a hardness of heart that can happen. You don't want to do a Bible assignment for a class and just get through it so you can get the grade, but then not apply that truth to your life because someday you will stand before God and answer for that. That's kind of a scary thought to me. And that's why James says, don't be a forgetful hearer, but make sure you are an effective doer. During these times of uncertainty, it is hard to find comfort sometimes. When every time you look on the news, there's a bad report and we hear about people in Jacksonville and the nursing homes and people contacting and contracting COVID-19. I personally know somebody who lost their mama here in Jacksonville yesterday from COVID-19. And so these are some tough times and there's some bad news and it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. And Asaph was having one of these moments. He was asking God if there was ever going to be favor again. Did he forget to show his goodness? Did he forget to show his mercy? Is that part of God's days over? Are we just living in the worst? Are we living in the end days? Um, are we being punished? Are we being judged? And Asaph was losing sleep over this. And I wonder if you've ever lost sleep about something in life. But when you meditate on the scripture and it's in you and it's a part of you, and then when God wakes you up or when you can't sleep because of uncertainty, then you can do what Asaph eventually did and find yourself meditating and remembering on God's word. I felt the need to do this series because meditation is so imperative and it's a lost art in these times. So I really hope you've enjoyed this series. I've hoped that you've learned something from it. This wasn't meant to be entertaining. It wasn't meant to be a lot of hoopla, but it's necessary. It's important. It's how we survive. Now, I've got today's questions, and if you're one of my students, then I need you to consider this as a two-day assignment and to consider it as a quiz. So don't skimp out on these answers. Make sure you do the right thing. Number one of today's questions, and if you're not one of my students, hey, I just challenge you to do it. So what you're going to do is you're going to take seven of the eight methods of biblical meditation and you're going to apply it to a verse you have not used during this series yet. And so I would take your, write your Bible verse out and then you're going to write number one. And maybe for number one, you're doing emphasizing the text. Now, obviously you can't emphasize verbally to me. So as you type that scripture out, I need you to change different words into italics for emphasis and I need you to do five different emphasis on your scriptures. The second question of the day, and this is part of your quiz as well, you need to read day six and seven of Reclaiming the Lost Art of Biblical Meditation Devotion, and I need you to write two paragraphs on what you got out of day six or seven. And there is no verse of the day today because you get to choose the verse of the day. And you know, I'm really excited to start the next series with you. We're actually going to get into a book of the Bible and start to study that and meditate on that together and break it down a little bit. Hey, I really love you guys. I thank you for joining me. Hopefully you'll jump in this next series with me and who knows what we'll do with the technology in the background. Again, I'm on a journey just like you. Love you. Have a great night.